This video offers calendrical interpretations of biblical messianic prophecy and patterns. Despite the implied confidence in the following presentation, these interpretations are in no way definitive and could be subject to alternative explanations. This presentation will reveal over two dozen biblical prophecies and patterns that point to the precise biblical year of the Messiah's first and second comings. We will systematically review each prophecy and pattern and watch it build and reinforce a 7,000 year messianic timeline that reveals a first coming in 30 CE and a second coming in 2030 CE. What we will find is that dozens of prophecies and patterns accurately determined the exact year of our Messiah's first coming. These same prophecies and patterns also show us the exact year of his second coming. Since these prophecies and patterns were accurate in predicting yeah, his first coming, would it not be reasonable to expect the same degree of confidence in predicting his second coming? This timeline is hidden in the creation events found in Genesis chapter 1. It is even hidden in the design of the tabernacle. It is hidden in the parables of the Messiah. It is hidden in detailed events in the Old and New Testaments. It is hidden in the words of the prophets. As you will soon see, this messianic timeline is found everywhere in the scriptures. These and more will be included in this presentation. The Creation Prophecy The prophet Isaiah wrote that the end is declared in the beginning. The beginning is found in Genesis verse 1, chapter 1, in the creation account. What you are about to see is how the creation account reveals God's plan for mankind and everything he will accomplish. God's creation could have been created instantaneously, but as you know, it was not. God intentionally marked seven days for seven specific creation events. There's a reason that God not only marked seven days for creation, but why he also specifically chose to do what he did on those days. These seven days and corresponding events describe and detail a 7,000 year plan for mankind. God's whole plan for man, with corresponding timing, is found in the first chapter of the Bible. Before we reveal the details of the creation prophecy, we first need to illustrate an important prophetic principle. The one day as a thousand years prophetic principle. This principle teaches that when the Bible mentions a literal day, depending on context, it can be prophetically connected to a span of 1,000 years. This is not a new concept. Some early Christian writings describe the one day as a thousand years principle in biblical prophecy. Epistle of Barnabas, chapter 15, verses 3 through 5, 100 CE. He speaks of the Sabbath at the beginning of the creation. And God made in six days the works of his hands. And on the seventh day, he made an end. And he rested on the seventh day. And he sanctified it. Consider, my children, what this signifies that he made an end in six days. The meaning of it is this, that in 6,000 years, the creator will bring all things to an end. For with him, one day is a thousand years. He himself testifies saying, behold, the day of the Lord shall be as a thousand years. Therefore children in six days, that is in 6,000 years, all things shall be accomplished. And he rested on the seventh day. He means this, that when his son shall come, he will destroy the season of the wicked one and will judge the godless and will change the sun and the moon and the stars. And then he will truly rest on the seventh day. Irenaeus 150 CE. For in as many days as this world was made, in so many thousand years shall it be concluded. This is an account of the things formerly created, as also it is a prophecy of what is to come. For the day of the Lord is as a thousand years and in six days created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the 6,000th year. Methodius, 300 CE. For in six days God made the heaven and earth, and finished the whole world, and blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. So by a figure in the seventh month, when the fruits of the earth have been gathered in, we are commanded to keep the feast to the Lord, which signifies that when this world shall be terminated at the 7,000 years, when God shall have completed the world, he shall rejoice in us. Then when the appointed time shall have been accomplished and God shall have ceased to form this creation in the seventh month, the great resurrection day, it is commanded that the feast of our tabernacle shall be celebrated to the Lord. Notice how these early writers connect this concept back to creation. 
But where do we find this one day is a thousand years principle in the Bible? In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, we see that in the context of the day of the Lord, the teaching of a day being 1,000 years long is somehow connected. Peter presents this one day is a thousand years principle in the context of the biblical creation account to address skeptics ridiculing how long it is taking for the Messiah to arrive. Now we must ask the question, where did Peter obtain this one day as a thousand years principle? Peter doesn't say exactly, but we do find a similar verse in Psalms. Psalm chapter 90, verses 3 through 4. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. As we can see, this verse also associates a 1,000 year period as a day. The author of this psalm is uniquely attributed to Moses by scholars. Where would Moses have understood this concept as a thousand years as a day? We find a clue in the preceding context, which specifically mentions how man will return to dust. Where are we first told that man will return to dust? We're told this in Genesis 3, and perhaps unsurprisingly, Moses would have been quite familiar with the book of Genesis, since he was the author of it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Why was Adam told he would return to dust? Because Adam was told that he would die the same day that he ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This verse has confused many. Adam did not literally die the same day that he ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It appears to be a contradiction. This has led some to suggest, well, Adam spiritually died that day and literally died later. This may make sense in some minds, but God literally defined death as a consequence of this specific sin as returning to dust. And that same death was declared to supposedly occur on that same day. So the explanation of a spiritual death makes sense until one thinks about it for about 15 more seconds. Adam returned to dust much later. We need a better explanation. Since the death related to Adam's sin is clearly defined for us as a returning to dust, and that happened to Adam much later, not the same literal day, then it must be the word day that we're not understanding correctly. The only reasonable conclusion is that God must have not meant a literal 24-hour period in his usage of the word day. It's this quest for a better understanding of the word day in the context of what was said directly to Adam that leads us down a rather fascinating path. We find that Adam lived to be 930 years old until the day he died. Genesis chapter 5 verse 5. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Adam lived 70 years shy of exactly 1,000 years. Thus, if God was using 1,000 years as a day when declaring to Adam that he would surely die the same day, then that would make much more sense. In that sense, Adam did actually die the same day he ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, if a day is intended to be understood as 1,000 years. And now we understand where Moses and Peter generated the understanding that, in some way, 1,000 years equals one day to God. That understanding is necessary to avoid a clear contradiction in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. While all of that might be rather fascinating, and it certainly is, there is much more to consider. It all connects back to the Messiah as well. How? When we read Isaiah chapter 65 verses 18 through 25, which is all about the future 1,000 year reign of our Messiah, we find some interesting language, such as verse 23, they shall not labor in vain, or verse 25, dust shall be the serpent's food. All of these statements and more found in Isaiah chapter 65 and related to the 1,000 year reign of the Messiah. They're also directly connected to the same consequences of Adam's sin 
found in Genesis chapters 2 and 3. But there's more, and it all connects to a day as being a thousand years, and our Messiah. As already established, Adam died at the age of 930. As part of the Messiah's first coming, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22, Paul declared him to be the last Adam. So in the Messiah's first coming, he was a type of Adam and can be represented by the 930 years of Adam. Keep the number 930 in mind for the Messiah's first coming. While verse 22 refers to the first coming, in verses 23 through 24, we discover that the Messiah will reign for a period of time and refers to his second coming. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 23 through 24, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. More specifically, when the Messiah reigns, we are to understand that he will reign as a type of King David. Luke chapter 1, verse 32. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Just as Adam died at 930 years, David died at the age of 70. In the Messiah's second coming, we know that he will come back and reign as King David. Let's follow the math. The Messiah, in his first coming, as the last Adam, is connected to Adam, who no, died at 930. In his second coming, as King David, he's connected to David, who died at 70. 930 plus 70 equals 1,000. You may notice that this connects directly our Lord and Messiah's reign as 1,000 years. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. As we already established, a day is as a thousand years, and our Lord and Messiah will reign for a thousand years. And now you know why this thousand year period is also referred to as the day of the Lord in prophecy. And we can now also see why Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, refers to the day of the Lord when mentioning the day as a thousand years principle. Yet Peter reveals so much more on how to properly apply the prophetic nature of a day being a thousand years. In the context of Peter revealing the one day as a thousand years principle, he provides a clever demonstration on how it works. To do this, he notes that land and water was created on a certain day. And interestingly enough, he also mentions the correlated fact that the world was also destroyed by water. In this fascinating way, Peter implies a connection between the second day of creation and Noah's flood. What that means, according to Peter, is this. The second day of creation predicted which millennia Noah's flood would occur. Why does Peter provide this insight as a response to why it's taking so long for the Messiah to return for the Day of Judgment? What does the creation account have to do with the second coming of the Messiah? The answer is simply fascinating. Peter brilliantly teaches us how to prophetically interpret creation and then leaves his readers to extrapolate this insight even further. And that is exactly what we are going to do. When we use this interpretive method for all the days of creation, we not only see the whole plan God has for mankind, but we see the two specific timestamps of when the Messiah is to come. Once we see these two timestamps revealed, we then see Peter's point. Peter's hidden conclusion is that the second coming of the Messiah will be about 2,000 years later. In this way, Peter answers the skeptics asking in a scoffing manner, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. While Peter answers the scoffers by noting that the Messiah's return is a couple of millennia away, those 2,000 years have now nearly passed, and the second coming of the Messiah may not be so far off for us. Here's how the creation prophecy works. Day 1, Biblical Year 0 to Biblical Year 1000. On day one of creation, light and darkness were separated. In the first millennia of man, Adam and Eve sinned, and thus introduced darkness in man. The separation of good and evil, light and darkness in man, is the fulfillment of day one of creation. Day two, biblical year 1000 to biblical year 2000. 